All right, so uh, I think I remember all this. Uh, all right, so thanks for whoever set this up. It's pretty cool. And it's uh, at first I thought, oh my god, I don't want to do this. I'm so busy moving. So yeah, I'm moving to America. This thing takes place in Ottawa, Canada, right? So I'm done with my coursework, so I can I can be free and like be a journeyman philosopher, you know. A journeyman like they travel, right, from master to master, right? Maybe I'll get a new master. We'll see. Anyway, but um, so I thought. Then after uh, I slept on it, I thought, you know, what would be perfect for me to give the spiel to you, whoever shows up, that I first gave to Professor Nevelt when I had my first interview. So when I I emailed this place and said, hey, you know, could I go to apply here, you know? And uh, what could I study? And so then they said, why don't you come talk to Professor Nevelt, right? So that was actually a good idea. He ended up uh, advising my thesis, right? And he suggested the uh, the most important thing he did was he suggested a topic. All my topics got shot down, right? Everything that I knew about, actually, when I came into this school, got shot down. And then some guy I never even heard of, Empedocles, that became my topic. Just one word, Empedocles, right? Anything about him. And, uh, but it ended up being so perfect. I don't know if I'm even going to get to the point where Empedocles relates to what I'm going to talk about. Tonight, maybe, maybe not. It all depends on you all, right? So anyway, but this is where I started when I came into the school. So I remember I went into his office and we spent about an hour. And first thing I did was I drew this, drew this four square thingy, right? So I'm going to warm up to it. So does everybody know what the four causes are? That's my topic is what this means. And I was, and what goes in this empty quarter? So the first thing we want to learn is, and okay, so the basic idea is, is how is Aristotle and pre-modern philosophy going to relate to evolution and emergence? So emergence and evolution are two modern ideas. So evolution has been around since ancient times, just kind of the idea of it. But it wasn't like actually proven until like the 1800s. And then emergence is an idea that sort of emerged in the 1800s as like in philosophy of science. And it just means that new stuff can actually come to be. That's like real stuff and not just random crap that some guy invents like, oh, I'm going to make up a song, right? That's not like a real thing. But like, a creature that could make a song, that's a real thing. So can that emerge from nowhere? That's my question, right? And so I was dealing with that question when I first showed up here, which I don't know what year that was. Was that like 2016 or 2017? It was forever ago. It seems like ancient times. But anyway, I drew this four square on it, and I asked him, what goes in this quarter? So we're going to ask that question tonight. And so the, the, the whole question only makes sense if you read Aristotle. And so there's this one concept that he has that's the four causes. It's pretty simple. It's like so simple anybody could know it, right? But then once you learn it, learn the four causes, then all of a sudden you can really take off and become a freaking genius and think about anything, right? It's, it's pretty awesome. Anyway, so the four causes, these are four things that you can use to explain things. Explain things that happen in space and time. So this is from the physics. So the physics only deals with stuff that happens in space and time. A thing changes. And it's stuff that just changes itself. It doesn't have to be changed by, like, something else, right? Like, no god pops out of a wormhole and does it, you know, or anything like that. So there's four ways that you can explain stuff that happens. And one is by talking about what it, something's made of, you know? 
Like why, why does you know this blackboard float or uh, sit on the table rather than float around? Well, because of the matter it's made of. Why is it good for writing on with chalk? Well, that's because of the matter, and not only the matter is good, but the form is good too. Somebody took this stone, I assume it's stone, right, some kind of stone, and they made a, a applied form to it, which means they made it rectangular and extremely flat. Like sometimes you find flat stones in nature, right? But like, this is really flat. You're never going to find a stone this flat in nature. So that's matter and form. So some things about this blackboard can be explained just by virtue of the matter, like the color, for example. Nobody, I don't think anybody colored this green, right? It's just a, probably a green stone. I've seen green stones in, out in nature, but I assume, but that's the matter. But then the form is like something that was imposed on it. So those are two different kinds of explanations that Aristotle talks about. And another kind of explanation is like, well, who imposed the form on it? Well, somebody, you know, somebody made it flat. Somebody cut it to a rectangle. And that's the, the agent. That's how we translate it. I don't even know what the, green, the Greek word for agent is. But uh, anyway, that's, a, that's the agent applies the form to the matter. Those are three causes. The fourth cause is why does the agent want to apply it? mess with the matter and the form, you know? And the end, that's the end, or the telos, right? And that's, well, so that people can scribble on it, right? People can write things on it, and they can talk and act smart, right? That's the, the purpose, or the end. And in Greek, it's the telos, which just literally means the end, the last thing, or the completion, right? So when things are complete, then, you have a certain piece of matter with the form, the right form, and that form serves the purpose or the end. Okay, everybody with me, right? Everybody knows. No way. So then, Aristotle goes on further, and this is, he starts uh, saying more interesting stuff, right? And he says, well, there's two kinds of agents. And that one kind of agent is, the, is an agent that uses skill. And this is, this is, skill is a translation for techne, the Greek word. You could say craft in German, skill, art. There's, that's, I don't know, there's like a lot of words, but skill. So, and then there's another kind of agent, it's, which is nature. Nature is our word for phusis, right? And what's the difference between skill and, and nature? In both cases, you have matter and a form, and then there's a purpose, but the agent is different. The agent has a different relation to the product. And with this blackboard, for example, this blackboard was made by a human being. That's the agent. But with natural things, like human beings, human beings have a form, we have a matter, but we're made by other human beings. And that's called nature. So the agent is a, another human being. So Aristotle says what both of these have in common is that all four causes are there. There's a form, the form, when the matter takes a form, it's complete and it's formed by something and that something, that agent, is something of the same name. So humans are made by something of the same name, humans. But blackboards are made by something of the same name, which is a blackboard maker, right? But it doesn't have the same nature. That's the difference between skill and nature, right? So Aristotle takes, has different kinds of causes, right? different forms of, and these both fall under the name of production, which is in Greek, poesis. This is where we get poetry. But poesis is making anything. Nature is a form of production. 
reproduction, right? But other kinds of production are artificial kinds of production. So Aristotle not only has the four <laughs> causes, but he has different ways those four causes can relate, different kinds of processes. And so uh, this is phusis is nature, and techne is skill or craft, right? Now, he also had, there's, there's other things that go on. Can anybody think of something that happens in space and time that's not natural or artificial? That's not nature, like a form on matter and an end, right? So Aristotle says that there is something, and that something is praxis. So I forget which book it is. Uh, maybe you know, but like there's a book where he contrasts making and doing. I think it might be book theta, right? And this is a translation. The translation is techne and praxis. So he contrasts making and doing. Making is techne. You're producing things. And you know you're, you've accomplished it when the matter that you're working with has that form, and that form serves the purpose, right? And that's it's like, uh, that's technique, skill, but lots of things. In fact, the most important things that human people do are not making anything. And it's not, like, human beings do things by nature, which is just instinctively or metabolically, like we get pregnant and we, you know, give birth and then we just raise kids. That's kind of phusis, right? And then we make things, you know, whether it's making blackboards or following a recipe, right? We make things, but then there's another thing that humans do that's, it's really weird, okay? It's called praxis. And praxis, the interesting thing about praxis is there's no, there's no form to it. It's like, there's not really a form. And it's, it's kind of weird that it's not really matter. Like, so is there a matter and form? Like, those of you who know what praxis is, is there a matter and form to praxis? It seems like there's just an end. Like, we know what the end is, right? But it's not sure what the matter and form is. Uh, so what's a, a good example of praxis, for example, that I like to uh, use is... For example, uh, from the American Civil War, right? Abraham Lincoln had a serious problem at the beginning of the American Civil War, right? So he had people who wanted to secede and go form their own country. And so, for whatever reason, he wanted to, like, at all costs, keep the country as one country. That was his end, right? And he wanted that one country to be the one that he was the president of. He didn't want, like, those other guys, the bad guys, to conquer his country and then take over. Like, that wouldn't have satisfied his end, right? He wanted him to be president at the end of those four or eight years, however long it took to defeat those bad guys, right? So there was an end, right? But he wasn't, like, following a cookbook recipe to make an apple pie, you know? or, uh, you know, a blackboard, or anything like that. He wasn't, it's not a natural form of production, like getting pregnant, or anything like that. That's praxis. You have a purpose, but, and there's an agent, there's a purpose, and then there's an agent who's definitely doing it, right? But, it's not really production, right? You could say that, um, like, for example, in many places in Aristotle and in Plato, uh, they mention military strategy as being a technique or a skill. Or an episteme, actually, is probably what they're saying. That's the word they're probably using. Like, if you read, like, Plato and Aristotle, they say, what about military strategy? You know, the person who uses that uh, science, you know, has to produce victory, right? But you're not really producing something in the same sense as when you're using 
techne, right? Because you're producing the thing. You're producing victory. Like you, you produce victory, but you have, you don't really know how you're going to do it. You know, all you have is a goal, and then you have sorts of rules of thumb or principles that are relevant to that, and then you kind of go with your gut and persuade people who are with you in this to trust you with their lives. Something like that, right? And then you just go gonzo and, you know, cross the Rubicon and maybe it works out. That's, kind of, that's like praxis. So praxis is like a really weird thing. But Aristotle compares praxis and techne quite often in that there's a purpose, you know, at the beginning of the ethics, which is about praxis, right? The Nicomachean ethics is not about, like, it's not a, it's not a techne. It's an episteme, but it's not an episteme of techne. It's not a science of techne. It's not a productive science. It's a practical science of action, right? And so what is action? Like, well, we know that there's an agent. We know who's doing it. We know, well, we kind of know what the purpose is. Like, Aristotle actually seems to think that he's defined the purpose, right? But what's the matter in the form? It seems quite different, right? And so Aristotle compares and contrasts techne and praxis in various places in his work. And then he also contrasts techne and phusis in other places, like in Book Theta, right? And in the physics, which explicitly contrasts different forms of production. One, where the produced is the same as the producer by nature, and another where it merely has the same name. And it's a radically different thing. So in, in natural things always produce the same outcome unless they're frustrated, in which case they mess up. But artificial or skill can produce the, you can use skill to produce the opposite outcome. And it's kind of like in uh, a, uh, a builder is the person you want to talk to if you want to destroy a building or an engineer, right? He would know the perfect places to set the bombs to demolish a building in the easiest way to where you wouldn't have to have people go in a second time and set more bombs and then the building falls on them and they sue you, right? You want to put the bombs, the minimum amount of bombs on the building so that it all tumbles into nothing. One blast, right? That takes skill. Or like in Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes says, oh, a doctor is always the worst villain to catch because they know the body perfectly, right? They know exactly what people are like and especially if you go see a doctor, and this doctor wants to murder you, right? Then he knows everything about you, and he can kill you. That's the hardest murder to catch, is a doctor. And it turns out Dr. Moriarty yeah, is, you know. But, like, that's what Sherlock Holmes says in various places. And so that's a, a case of technique. Technique can be either, you can have opposite outcomes. So Aristotle compares and contrasts these two, and then these two as well. So that gave me the idea to compare and contrast them all, all at once. And so I drew this four-fold, four-square, whatever. And so I, at first I just drew this. And then I thought, well, what do these things have in common? Well, this is production. And production has form. You know you're going after a form. That's what these think. So there's a form. But then, in praxis, there's no form. You know that you've achieved it, but there's no form. Like, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't know what the actual... He didn't, like, hand his generals, like, a series, of, like a cookbook series or an algorithm. You can't follow an algorithm to win a war or to win a campaign. You know, like all the experts, like for example, Trump, when he declared his candidacy, all the experts were like, what a dumbass. I hope he runs because it'll embarrass those scumbags so horribly, right? But 
he just freaking nailed it, right? Came out of nowhere, embarrassed the crap out of everybody else. Well, that was praxis. Praxis is based on character. It's not based on a form, an idea that you have in your head. You can't follow a recipe cookbook. You can't follow an algorithm, right? And uh, there's a... Uh, um, that's praxis. So that's a good example of uh, praxis. It's like Trump winning that election and, you know, Lincoln winning that civil war or his generals winning a civil war. And uh, because not only Lincoln as the top leader, but each one of those generals had to exercise practice as well, praxis as well. Like Lincoln had to win the whole eastern half of North America and then each general had to win this part of North America, and they didn't know how they were going to do it. He just said, go do it, right? And so that's praxis. So there's no form to this, right? And so you can also compare them horizontally. So what's different between, or what's the same of this? Even though this is form and this is no form, what's the same is that there's someone doing it. There's a distinct agent. And that agent knows what they want. And they're approaching the external world to deal with it in order to achieve what they want, right? And so uh, that's someone can take matter and apply form to it, or someone can basically just have a purpose and then achieve it, right? It's that little kid. So imagine a little kid who knows that they just want to be the richest guy in the world, or they want to conquer Asia, or they want to, you know, uh, be president or something like that, right? That's a goal, but there's no form. Like, what's the, there's no form to, it's not like, oh, I want to be, you know, an engineer. Well, you know, you just go to freaking school and you become an engineer. That's technic, right? It's not praxis. So there's, that's what someone does, but then there's no one. Who does phusis? When you do something by nature, you just do it. Like, it's not like you think, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm going to get pregnant, or I'm going to grow big. I'm going to be the biggest guy in the world. <laughs> or, or like, I'm going to like start pumping out the right hormones, and then I'm gonna, my voice is going to get deep, and... Uh, be a badass, you know, and I'll get more aggressive. No, you just do it, right? I mean, even if it's you, you're not doing it. It's just happening, right? I didn't decide to grow big. I mean, it's not like, not really up to me. So nobody's doing nature. So this is a form of production, but nobody's doing it. It's just happening, right? Um, you know, like, I mean, if anybody's doing it, it's God. But God's relation to the becoming or the production is a lot different from the relation of, like, the working to the product, right? I think it's so different. It's as different as God is to, you know, the workman. And God is quite different, you know, to a workman, right? I, I know it's common to say that... Uh, God's making of natural beings is very similar to this. But the thing is, God's making of nature is different from nature being nature after having been made, right? So once nature is made, it just does its thing. Like, but techne just doesn't do its thing. It just, people have to make the stuff. They have to decide that, oh, I'm going to be like a, you know, I'm going to be a blackboard maker, or I'm going to make, design cars, or I'm going to design spaceships, or I'm going to like <clears throat> program computers or something, or make a, write the great American novel or something like that. You know, that's something you have to do. You have to really make a decision that, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to devote my life to. But nature is... Oops, sorry. It's fun. Yeah, I, you know, it was a bad idea. I got a hanky, don't worry. Hey. Sit down. I'm going to hang you. Okay. That's what we have these things for. All right. Good. All right. So, you all get that idea? Okay. Any questions about that? Because that, 
maybe some of you might have a question about that. Maybe I missed something. Maybe you've read somebody who says something about technephusis or praxis that disagrees with what I'm saying. Is, is there a... Uh, I mean, there are, things, there are things like war fighting that you might, you might say that uh, that is kind of, it's kind of like a craft in some way. Like you say, there's sort of mm -hmm. some rules of thumb mm -hmm. and you try to follow them uh, as, as best you can. Though it certainly is like a lot, uh, a lot looser than, you know, uh, you know, the, the rules in, in, in making a, a perfect blackboard. Yeah. Um, but is there, is there a, a hard divide between, between uh, these things of praxis and these things that are, are techne, or is it, you know, a, a little bit amorphous? Because oh, yeah. Because when you... When there you is, it, it, it does overlap a lot. Yeah, you're correct to notice that. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of overlap. Like if you're working on a job site, sometimes you do things that are just dangerous. There's nothing technically wrong with them, but it was just rash for you to do this without, yeah. Well, n not, even, not even necessarily rash to, you know, mm -hmm. just like, you know, just in, in a craft too, there are certain rules of thumb, and then sometimes you have to make kinds of, of judgment calls that don't really have that much form. I, I don't know, maybe you're, you're uh, um, like hammering some 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 bronze uh, uh, cauldron or, or something, and you you know you kind of get part of it out of out of out of whack, and you need to sort of be creative and, and figure out a way mm -hmm. to uh, like hammer it out in the, in the right way. It's it's not necessarily just just like a, a praxis uh, something of praxis like uh, fighting. A war, you kind of need to take mm -hmm. in local circumstances, and it's not always done the same way. There are yeah. there are things like that uh, mm -hmm. um, in in craft too. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, and like, uh, but this is even though it's it's there's kind of a continuum, <clears throat> and there's a lot of skill too. Like I was actually in the army, and I was in combat arms, and like I thought about this a lot. There's a lot of skill you would train to do things. And there was like this thing called the smart book. And each task in the smart book, like, you know, load, lock and load an M60 machine gun. Well, that's technique. It's like a cookbook. And you have to be able to repeat each of those steps. It's not praxis at all. And then how you fit them, but how do you fit all those bits of things you do together, that's the praxis, right? Deciding how to train the troops, that's praxis. You know, the, the generals and the officers study things, you know, in college. Like about, well, you know, what the doctrine we have now, you know, what kind, is this really the kind of war we wanna, are we still rehashing the Vietnam War, right? Why don't we, change the doctrine to reflect, you know, some new aspect of battlefields, right? That's real praxis, right? Uh, when there's no, and the further you go down from that top level, the more techne it is. Yeah. So the less free it is. And so uh, that's, uh, and so it, it's a continuum. But it's, uh, it's really good to see, it's useful to analyze well, what's going on with different sorts of things that people do. Okay. Well, are technique and process ultimately distinguishable given that you know, the examples you give are pretty apt, but yeah. ultimately, ultimately, at some point in time, someone decided how an M16 or such and such a gun mm -hmm. would be uh, best um, reloaded. Yeah, and this was this was a matter of praxis. It's mm -hmm. time. It's true. Inventing something. Yeah. So inventing things, you you need skill to invent something. But at the same time, or science knowledge to invent something, you also need theory, which is another thing I won't deal with. Right? It's a different uh, sort of knowledge. But like, <clears throat> it's you're creating something that's completely new, right? So. That's kind of, this is something that Hannah Arendt mentions in uh, uh, 
the human condition and probably a few other books too. But human condition, she does a lot of these interesting things about how techne is like bleeding over into praxis in the modern world. But in the ancient world, it was they were quite separate. And uh, that, that's a really good book to read about this. It's interesting to you about how all this works in the modern world. So, is praxis a kind of knowledge? Or is it only that, or between the two is techne only? Oh, it, yeah, well like, uh, Aristotle says that there are practical <clears throat> principles. And that's what Nicomachean ethics is about, and the politics. Those are the, so the fact that there are principles which apply universally uh, means that there is knowledge, but it's practical knowledge. It's not productive or technical knowledge. It's not knowledge of nature, which is theory. Natural knowledge is universal and absolutely like eternally true. Productive knowledge is like the algorithm or process you go through to produce something. But then practical knowledge is something which represents either like a concern that you have to include in your decision-making processes, right? You have to take it into account. Like you have to take into account the fact that people shouldn't be murdered, right? Or killed, right? So, but that doesn't mean you won't ever kill anybody. You might have to kill somebody, but you have, you should take into account that killing is bad and you have to require really intense incentives, really a massive uh, countervailing principles or circumstances to cause you to kill somebody, right? But it's always true that killing is like really bad. You know, so that's like a practical principle and you have to, but then if you're trying to find out, well, why is killing bad? That's kind of like theory, right? I don't know. It's, uh, but like, yeah, that's, uh, there is knowledge, but practical knowledge is just different from technical or scientific knowledge. So, so, so we might be getting in the weeds. So the practical knowledge is the theory in some ways that sits behind it. So yeah, like, there is a theory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, but it's, it's practical. Yeah. Okay. Like you can have theory, a theory of this, like I took welding courses a year or so ago and we had welding theory, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what theory means when Aristotle is using that word, but it, we're getting, it's getting off. I, and what I'd like to do right now is I think the questions that I am getting tell me it's time to move on to the empty quarter, right? So, I want you all to tell me what's in this empty corner. Evolution. So there's no one doing it, and there's no form. Right. Is there a change that could do that? Is there that sort of change? Does that exist? So we know that you can have something which is like a real form of doing something <clears throat> by someone that really accomplishes something. And yet there's no form for that completion, that accomplishment. There's no specific form for it. You just know when you've achieved it. You know, you know when you uh, have conquered Asia. Right? You know when you've conquered uh, you know, the Mediterranean. You know when you've uh, put down the rebels you know, or uh, won a, a campaign. But there's no, like, platonic idea of the, how that's realized in heaven, right? And so, if you had something like, that's kind of like praxis with respect to form, and kind of like phusis with respect to the agent, what would it be? It would be something that would invent something new, and yet nobody's inventing it, right? So this is, obviously, it's evolution, I suppose. It's obvious to me. But like, uh, the interesting thing is that there is, just like there's making and doing on this top level, on this bottom level, there's two modern words, which just so happens they're based on Greek words. Uh, ontogeny, 
and phylogeny. And so they both come from Genesis, different kinds of Genesis. So just like both of these are poesis, both of these are Genesis. But the two kinds of Genesis. One is ontogenesis, which means the genesis of beings. So genesis of things. So phusis is ontogenesis or ontogeny. Right? That so ontogeny is the process of going from a you know a zygote, I guess, or forming that zygote, right? All the way until you're ready to you know fertilize your own zygote when you get old, right? That's completion. That's the realization of that ontogenesis, right? So there's a, an end to ontogeny. There's an agent. It's the thing itself or a thing of the same nature. There's the form and the matter, right? That's ontogeny. But what's interesting is in phylogeny, like we think of, oh, well, how come evolution isn't nature? Well, if you're thinking nature from the way that Aristotle defines it, Nature, for Aristotle, is only ontogeny. It's production. There's a form. There's matter. You stick them together, boom, right? That's not how evolution works. There, is there a form somewhere? Now, some people, in a sense, there is a form somewhere. And we could get to that. Maybe we'll get to that. I hope so. But uh, in, in, it's, the form is there in a different way from the way it is in Techne and Fusus. The form is like already in the DNA or something, and it's in the mind of the producer with technique, right? So that's a, there's already a form. So, but with praxis and with this, which we'll call phylogeny, there's no pre-existing form, but there is a pre-existing purpose, right? And so, anybody know what phylo means? Is that a, like a type, kind of? Or a... Yeah. Well, it literally means a branch. Okay. Phyto means plants. Phylo means the, the stems or branches, or even the leaves, I think, of plants, right? So, what it refers to is the forming of branches. So, phylogeny is the forming of branches on the tree of life. That's what it means. <clears throat> Uh, if you are talking about an actual tree, right? Forming a branch is just part of ontogeny, right? But then when you're forming, you have a tree of life, forming branches is phylogeny. So it's interesting, there's a relationship between these two. Um, so both are forms of genesis, and they're both well, they're both natural in this looser sense of the term, right? So, now if we're just saying nature, the way Aristotle uses nature, then phusis is definitely nature. Aristotle doesn't believe that there's such a thing as phylogeny. And uh, does anybody know why he says that? There's like a phrase that he uses. That it's called uh, actuality precedes potentiality. That's from Book Theta. Right? So, it just means that in order to have phusis, in order to produce a living creature, you have to have one of the same nature that pre-exists. Right? You, they don't... What, the weird thing is, they did believe in spontaneous generation, which is like so dorky. But he never mentions that. I, someday I'm going to read the, the thing. But like he, makes, he goes on and on about this in Book Theta of the Metaphysics. But then in the natural works, like in movement of animals and generation and corruption, he just says, oh yeah, it's sometimes bugs and mice just pop out of crap, you know, like, oh, well, really? But anyway, I'm not going to call him on that. When he's talking about the cosmos and substance and stuff like that in the metaphysics, right? Um, he just says, no, there's no freaking way. You don't have phylogeny. You have ontogeny. You need to have something of the same. But the interesting thing is, if you're saying that, then there's this empty quarter here, right? And so, 
So phylogeny and ontogeny are both forms of genesis. And so there's no form. So what's the, if there's no form, I can wrap my mind around that, right? If you can, in the sense that there's no form. Now, I know in one sense, there is a form to the realization of praxis, right? Like, one, real, one form is that, like, you, you know, like, if I told somebody that I was the ruler of, you know, that I would conquered Central Asia, like, nobody would freaking believe that. Because, like, where's my freaking band of warriors, right? How come they're not, like, protecting me from my, all these people who want to take my freaking turf, right? Like, if I was actually, you know, the, the great Khan of Central Asia, I would have, like, you know, you know, freaking a Praetorian guard following me around, all kinds of bitches, you know, and everything, and, you know, nobody could believe it. I don't match the type, right? And I'm just not the type of person to go kick ass like that, right? I'm just kind of a wimp, right? So, like, there is kind of a form to that. It's just kind of loose, right? Um, but, like, but in, really, I, I'm going to make the, I'm going to claim that there's only an end. And you can recognize that end. And, and in that sense, there's, like, a certain thing that you can point to and say, yeah, that's what the realization is. But it's like, it's not like phusis in phusis in ontogeny. There's a series of steps that you go from that single cell to the adult. You're not going through random crazy stuff, right? When you're looking at praxis, like I, I saw the recently saw the cool movie of the life of Genghis Khan, which is on YouTube for free, called Mongol, right? And so when you look at, say, for example, uh, his Assuming that from his young age, he wanted to conquer all of Asia, right? Um, or most of it, right? Except for like Southeast Asia and Japan, I suppose, right? Which is pretty much it. Assuming he wanted to do that, his life just went through all these crazy freaking ups and downs and everything. It's not like when you build a house, 